Yeah, who, who wants to ask their question? I'll, I'll do the rounds and if you just want to put your hand up and I'll give you the mic. Hi. Um, I was wondering, in the obviously existing cycle through to Tokyo, you've got the normal, obviously, Aussies and the Dutch, etc. Do you guys expect to come Tokyo any of the other teams to kind of come through who weren't perhaps as strong in Rio? I think that's quite a difficult question to answer because we've not kind of had a major tournament yet. Um, and uh, historically, after Olympic Games, there's a big clear out, not clear out, but a big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a big, a big clear out. Of <laughs> Yes, I think there will be. I think there's some up and coming teams, um, the likes of Spain. If you look at their world ranking, it's not necessarily one of the highest, but they're a very tricky team to play against. And we've struggled against them in the past. And I think in that quarter final, the best we've ever played against them and made it look quite easy, but it has not been in the past for them. Um, you know, look at the American team. They've risen from, I think they were 12th in London, and, and they were a real force in, in Rio. So. Yes, I do think that there will be teams challenging um, us at the top and as well with the game format that we've got, which is four lots of, of 15 minutes, it, it just makes it a lot a lot closer and a lot tighter. Um, I do this thing every day where I think I've lost my keys about seven times and I sort of pat, <laughs> pat myself down and I was wondering, you've had to pretty much carry your gold medals around. <laughs> in six or seven months, whether anyone, whether you guys or anyone on the team has either lost it or thought they've lost it, um, or misplaced it, anything like that. I don't think anyone's thought they lost it, they? I don't think so. Um, I'm very cautious of it. Um, and we've got like a third eye that's grown somewhere, it's always on my level. Um, but yeah, it's either, so since November, I've been back at Bisham and we've been with the new squad, and now it's very much Tokyo and the World Cup in two years. And We've got uh, the come off the end of two years and the European Championship, so it's focusing on that. So it's only when it comes to things like this, really, that you sort of remember Rio when you get the medal out. Um, but yeah, most of, most of the time, my boyfriend acts as a bodyguard with it wherever I go. Um, so I do have my sort of own bodyguard with the medal as well. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I did um, actually manage to, to break my medal um, on the dance floor. <laughs> the, the second night after the final. Um, you know, they're pretty weighty things. And uh, I may have been busting some moves on the dance floor. And it was, you know, flying up and down. And the next thing you know, it flies off the ribbon. It didn't, the, the thing didn't break. It just came off this. The pin came out. Um, and. Thankfully, because I was still out in, in Rio, um, I took it to the International Olympic Services, and uh, <laughs> they have one of those, and um, they made me a new one, which is quite special. <laughs> cool, who's next? Um, before I say anything else, um, thanks for working so incredibly hard and, and, and well done. I think. Uh, yeah, we were all confident that you would do something, but to go out and smash every game and then take a gold, it's just ridiculous. And um, I don't know about other people here, but what you were saying earlier about seeing Usain Bolt and being a bit, oh, I'm not that cool. Uh, you know, at the moment I'm a bit like, oh, you know, Max England players before, Max GB players before, but that's quite good. Um, so yeah, really well done. The, the question, getting to the point, um, I had was, I mean, this is phenomenal, it's been a while, 88 with boys, what do you think we in the hockey community can do to help make this happen again? Because obviously there's what's happening at Bisham, it's very impressive, read about it, DK, reasonably good coach. <laughs> But what can we be doing to produce people to come through and just keep doing this and then maybe make the Dutch a little bit less arrogant? Um, I think, well one, I think after Rio um, it's getting more people onto the pitch, um, whether that's youngsters taking up the game or whether that's people who have previously played hockey, giving up to have kids or careers and actually get back into it. And I think since Rio uh, that has happened, um, which is something that we had been aiming for over the, over the past two, three years. That was very much one of our goals, was to inspire the future, get people onto the pitch. 
um, and getting hockey out there more visible. Um, I think the more that both we can do internationally to help grow the game, and hockey clubs around the country can help grow the game, get more people into it, get it on the TV more, get it uh, as a, a main sport in this country, the better. Then we have more people playing it, there's a bigger pool, um, more competition for places, more competition to get better, and then naturally, as we've, as we've seen over the past four, eight, 12 years, hopefully climb up the rankings, um, and hopefully be a major force up there with the likes of Holland and Argentina for many years to come. But I think it's the biggest thing, as I said earlier, for me, since Rio is not the gold medal, it's the amount of kids, of people that come up to us and spoke about hockey and how they love it and they're starting to play it. Um, and I think hockey clubs play a massive role. Uh, hockey clubs are the reason I got into sport. I, uh, hockey, I didn't play at school. It was through a hockey club. And so for me, that's why I'm here today, the hockey clubs. Um, and so we want to try and help hockey clubs. We've been around the country getting people involved. Um, meeting people and the work that the volunteers do at the clubs um, is invaluable and as I said that's why half our, more than half our squad are there um, and so what we can do to help you to make it sustainable and keep kids uh, developing and keep people in the game um, I think better <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, like, before obviously you went into the um, Olympics, you were like, you know, your profile wasn't as big, and now you've come out and it's just massive. How are you finding the kind of media attention, like you've been on Strictly, um, <laughs> it's just all gone kind of wild really, like how are you finding that, and is it like quite natural, or, um, yeah? I honestly feel like I sort of wear two different hats, so... We all can, most of us, and it's probably not magic, but most of us can walk around the streets and no one has a clue who we are, unless they're hockey, hockey fans. Um, so we are still very, very normal people, <laughs> living in the same places, doing the same things. Um, but the odd occasions we've had, so Strictly for Children Need, uh, John the Ross Show, um, all different sorts of TV things we've all been on. Um, and the places we've been to, and been in, like, went to the Private Britain Awards and literally was surrounded by everybody in there. It was like uber famous. It was like very, very on the left. Simon Cowell on my right. I was like, what is going on here? Um, it's really nice. It was really nice to get glammed up in dresses and for a while. But I remember after that sort of three months after the Olympics thinking, oh, I just can't wait to get back into my trackies and just like get back to normal life. Um, and so I think it's really nice to have those opportunities and get hockey on the TV more and actually get people recognised for being hockey players and not just hockey players, women in sport on the TV. Um, which I think is massive, it's really, really nice to do. But I'm also very grateful that I'm still just Holly and I still just play hockey every day and that's what I love and just working towards the next thing. Um, so for me it's really nice to have had a bit of both. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't like to be a big celebrity. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I just want to reiterate what this gentleman said because, again, thank you for everything you've done. And um, it's incredible the impact it's had on so many, so many people. Um, my question is around psychology and psychology of sports. Um, you mentioned there were so many challenges in some of the matches that you had. and. You had to stay strong. You had to, um, you had to keep, just keep, keep on track of what you were doing. I mean, is that something? Do you do any sort of mindset training? Do you do any psychology training uh, within the the setup at all? Yeah, we, we you know, we um, we actually appointed a, a new psychologist um, two years before Rio, um, and she came in uh, Australian, um, absolutely fantastic, um, and. You know, we, we do a lot of work as a team psychology, but we also do work individually um, because, yeah, like like Holly said, it's eight games in 14 days, and obviously that's physically really challenging, but actually mentally, that I think that's what I found the hardest. You know, and those last couple of games are the most important games. So, actually, you know, mentally, you need to be so switched on, and um, you know, different people have different. Feel, feel it differently, but you know, not feeling under pressure, feeling confident. Um, so yeah, we did we did a whole a whole lot of work in that, and I think it's you know really really important in, in sport nowadays. Sure. Um, 
lots of people have kind of asked me what was the reason you won gold and, and I put a lot of it down to Andrea, our psychologist, I think the level that we play top sport, I am going to put a figure on it, it's about 70% top sport, we've all got skills, we've, we can all do it but it, it's the mindset that makes the real difference and we worked on so many different things as a team but also as individuals and for that reason I feel like we really, really know ourselves inside out. I know what Holly feels and thinks and, and behaves when she's having a good, good day and a bad day and the same with Georgie. We, we've kind of explored all that as a team and, and we really knew ourselves inside and out and that was the work that Andrea, our psychologist, did with us. So it was a massive thing bringing her on board and um, she was a real driving force behind us, behind our team, behind the team, as we like to call them. Hi, I'm at the back. Hi, yeah. Um, I have a question for you, kind of regarding the two things that we've spoken about. Uh, talking about like the training you had with things outside of just the physical, what you're doing there. I'm also wondering, did you get like training for everything that comes after winning that goal? So just things like the media appearances and, and all this other stuff you do. Was it kind of like, hey, good job, there's John from Ross next week? <laughs> or was it like, we're going to help you out and kind of not let you be like this lost person in the middle of a camera? Um, well, kind of what one of us touched on before, we'd planned meticulously up to Rio. And then after that final, we were just a bit lost about what to do. Um, but I think what hockey do really well is, is they create well-rounded athletes. So we're very much encouraged to have things running alongside our sport because we're not footballers or rugby players that can rely on our salaries, so if we were to have a horrific injury, <laughs> so wasn't prepared for that. Um, but no, like Shona said, I think uh, all of us, all of us have either got degrees or compete or completed to get degrees, and um, I think we all had a little bit of experience in the past. Um, but I think we're all just very normal people, and so when it comes to interviews, we just try and be ourselves. Um, so yeah. I was just wondering, have you had any involvement in choosing the new captain? Um, <laughs> so we, we started in November as the new squad um, and we're still waiting for some players in our squad to come, come back in. So players who have been playing, involved in the programme like Alex Dancer for 16 years, I think. 16 years? So, not bad, but I mean a long time. Um, she has taken a bigger break, so she's actually not back in until next Monday she starts back. Um, and then we've had three of the girls come back in this week, so we've had Nick White come back in, Maddie Hitch and, and Sophie Bray. Um, so we're still waiting for everyone to come back in um, before that process sort of starts really. We don't know how it's going to look um, and how it's going to evolve. I do think it's, you know, it's a very um, unique situation having had someone be captured for such a long period of time and I think the really important thing is is that I've seen a lot in the media about oh who's going to be the next big cap the next captain and I actually I get a bit annoyed at that because I think you're bigging it up to be this you know someone whoever's going to take that place it's, it's a very you know big role to fill and actually I think um, however the GB program do it I think it'd be really important that there's a leadership group and you know a couple of players are supported in in those roles you know maybe share it around a bit and then actually a natural leader will come through and you know there's no point in bigging it up to be this big big thing because you know actually putting all that pressure on one person to fill coach shoes it, it's you know it's just not fair <laughs> so um so yeah I think it'll be really interesting and I think it you know I'm sure that the staff and the team will, will handle it really well Evening. How does it feel? <laughs> you feel like being the Lincoln City supporter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's an easy one. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, no, good evening, ladies, and thank you for coming and congratulations again. But um, your warm-ups interest me. Pardon the expression for the games. Um, playing as I do sometimes just don't, you want to warm up, your brain's not there, it's a big game, but you're just not on the ball. You, did you do a warm up 
off the pitch and then you go on and do your practices with your mates or whatever, you seem to have a set routine. Because we were all watching in the stands and we were trying to get you to wave or things, but you were all focused and you all knew what was what. Was that decided beforehand? Um, I think, you know, as you know, we're quite a superstitious team, and so, yeah, we do everything the same. And, you know, once we've won one game, we do it the same. And actually, we, you know, we knew what our warm up um, was going to entail. You know, we, we made sure that we were happy with everything that was in it. Um, you know, before Rio, done it in previous games and tweaked things that we wanted in the stick and ball side of things. Um, but yeah, obviously when we were out in Rio, we would do the physical warm-up on the um, outside side, pitch. outside the pitch. And then we would grab our stuff, go to the main pitch um, for the stick and ball warm-up. And everyone has their partners. And you know, people have their... You, you actually know when people are running off to the loo at a certain point. <laughs> yeah. Because it's literally like to the second. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, and you know, we all want to just be in the zone. Get, everyone has their slightly different routines. Um, that's all part of it, and I think that's all, also we know each other so well. You know, we know what everyone does in the warm up, and I think that's all part of you know the, the importance of getting ready for that first game. And it worked obviously. So I think we at the end. Thank you. question, please. Uh, gentleman here. Hi there. Congratulations. Um, I guess my question is, I remember at the time of the final, there was quite a lot after it, people saying it's not just about us, it's about the whole squad, the ones that aren't here in Rio. To not be selected to go to Rio, there must have been heartbreak, you know, and there must be a lot of competition within the squad. Um, what was kind of like the dynamic like with your mates, presumably, who then don't get to go to Rio, but then must be delighted for you, the fact that you've won a gold. What's that like? Uh, it's, it's really tricky. Um, I remember the day of selection, you, you sort of look down the email, you see your names on there, and it's sort of a mixture of emotions. You're obviously happy you've got selected, but then there's your close friends who have done exactly the same as you over the last four years or longer. Um, some of our training sessions and what we go through is really, really tough. Um, and you know what they've been through, like physically, emotionally, done everything the same as you. Um, and the margins of being selected are tiny, like the tiniest thing. It just could be like two people play better together than these two people. It doesn't mean they're better individually. Um, so it was really, really tough. And without the, the squad of 31, there is no way we would have got that gold medal. Um, the, the benefit that we have of that is the competition for places, as you said. And so every day at mission when we go to training, every day everyone has to turn up because Every training session is videoed, um, you're constantly being analysed, and selection is always on the cards for the next tournament coming up. Um, so, without that level of competition, we wouldn't have pushed each, each other on the pitch. You know, you want to get better individually, but I want X to get better because if she gets better, then the, the team and the squad gets better. So, we are really, really close. We know each other so well. It's 31 very different individuals um, that you learn to. Get to, well, you get to know, you get to know how they work, how they're feeling, and you become so, so close. And um, after winning that gold medal, it was really hard to be a two girls out there that have been selected as travelling reserves. So they got to sort of live with us in the village, come to everything. The only thing they didn't get to do was play, and so they didn't get a medal. Um, and they were incredible. Um, she was three over there. Um, they were absolutely incredible. And then obviously the girls at home who didn't get to go to anything. And that's been the hardest thing since getting back, is everyone talks about the medalists and, and what you've done in this, and actually there is all the other girls who didn't get one, didn't get to go, um, equally have a part in this gold medal. Um, so it's a tough environment, but without it, we would not, we would not be where we are now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Maddie's book? Do you know anything about it? Or is it it's blank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, some pages are actually blank, and sometimes it is kind of just a like a mind, like a you know, playing mind games with the opposition because it has been you know in the Europeans. I think it was quite heavily on TV, and then obviously at Rio. But um, I think there are some little uh, notes on what uh, specific players do at shuffles um, and she, she studies them 
meticulously and even just down to their body position or where the ball is in relation to their left foot, right foot, whatever it may be. Um, and then I know that she uses her water bottle as well. She studies corners um, down, to, down to the tee and uses the water bottle. Just, just kind of like reminder, like refreshing notes to, you know, when she's in the heat of the moment that she can kind of switch back on and know exactly what she wants us to do around her or what she's going to do so she can try and think clearly. Who would you say is the joke of the group? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> jokers. Uh, well, a lot of us laugh at Lily Owsley. <laughs> um, she doesn't really mean to be funny, but we just laugh at her. Um, another girl who's, who's quite funny is, is Nick White. Um, she comes out with some fantastic one-liners, which she doesn't mean either. Um, and then probably the third one is the most open person that I've ever met. And you probably know what's going on in her life by just looking at her social media, and that's Susie Townsend. Um, she's, she's just one of a kind, and if you ever have the pleasure or not so much pleasure to meet her family, you'll know where she gets it from. Hi, yeah, um, can I really have a couple more, because obviously I'm keen for you, you girls to go, because you know, get back for it. got training there. Yeah, <laughs> um, and also we want some photos as well, so last few questions. Sorry guys. Hiya, um, I'll join everybody else in saying well done and congratulations and just how much you've inspired the hockey at grassroots level, certainly from our club anyway. Um, but my question was, um, I don't know much about being a professional athlete, but I'm sure you have to work pretty hard most of the time and have to concentrate a lot. But what do you do to have fun and like hair down and relax? Do you think oh, you're allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm not playing hockey, I work part-time as well, so, um, which isn't fun. Um, that's a part of it, so definitely not fun. Um, I don't know, I like to go back home home, so I like to go back up to Derbyshire and just see my friends and family and things that are familiar. Um, so it doesn't sound very fun, but for me that is, just spending time with yeah, friends and family. I, I like to go shopping too. I think um, for me, I actually, after London 2012, I moved to London um, because I actually found sometimes the hockey environment a bit too much of a bubble. So actually I then, um, I found that kind of as my like escape um, and would travel in and out to, to Mission um, and that kind of was, you know, I could see my friends more easily um, because that was actually really important to me. Um, you know, just from a not getting, otherwise I would find under pressure and, you know, the intensity too much. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, just seeing friends. Um, I think, you know, it's important to, to make sure that you, you know, do go and do other things as well, you know, especially when it's such a, you know, you're looking out the next four years towards Tokyo. Um, you know, when we have our downtime, planning plan a holiday, um, you know, we always get given kind of September off normally. Um, so, uh, you know, and I do think it's important to just switch off from hockey as well. All right, I have a little bit of a controversial question. <laughs> so, you said the cycle was four years. Um, obviously, I think a lot of people think the Euros was kind of the big tournament that kind of tipped you towards the Olympics. But I thought potentially the World Cup, because you didn't perform as well as you did, how much do you think as a squad that was a turning point for you? Because obviously it was quite controversial. Mm -hmm. I think um, the World Cup was massive because it was so it was so it was such a difficult time um, you know I had never quite experienced something like the World Cup and um, it was really really tough and I think um, coming back from that we as a group um, sat down you know we had so many meetings discussing it and I think it really was a turning point in terms of us realizing you know what needed to change what needed to be done um, and I think we learned a huge amounts from that and you know as horrible as that experience was I do think um, it made all the difference um, and really you know, made us address what needed to change and what what needed to happen and I think it really it also drove us you know because we were like well we can't experience anything like that ever again um, so um, so yeah I do I don't think that's a controversial question at all <laughs> 
Okay, um, right. I think that is about time. Um, obviously, like I said, keen for you guys to have some photos. Um, before we finish, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's been great to have. Thank you for all your Twitter as well. The Twitter is going off. Um, I've never had so many notifications. It's been very annoying. <laughs> it's great. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming along um, to make this event.